greetings to you for this service for Trinity Sunday. Our opening acclamation found in the prayer book on page 355 points to the reality of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us, your servants, grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory, O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Proverbs, the eighth chapter. Does not wisdom call and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth when he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. In place of a psalm, we will follow the lectionary in choosing an option of a canticle found in the uh, service for morning prayer, Canticle 13, and it is found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 90, page 90, a very Trinitarian canticle, and I encourage you to say it along with me as we say it in unison. Glory to you, Lord God of our fathers. You are worthy of praise. Glory to you. Glory to you for the radiance of your holy name. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you in the splendor of your temple on the throne of your majesty, glory to you. Glory to you, seated between the cherubim. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you, beholding the depths in the high vault of heaven, glory to you. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, beginning in the first verse. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, 
and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sunday, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
I've given up trying to understand it, my friend said. She's shaking her head in near exasperation. I heard, I heard defeat in her voice. And it's not that my friend isn't bright, well-versed in the Christian faith. She's an executive for a Christian publishing company. She's gone to church all her life. But we were talking about the Trinity. She concluded it was impossible to grasp. I, uh, she, she just said, I, I just, I can't get it. Another time, another friend, sitting around a table for a group discussion, he said, I, I just don't see the need for it. We were talking about this ancient picture of God as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's not that he didn't believe in the Christian basics or in the importance of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but he wondered why complicate things by talking about the Trinity? Can't we just say there's a God, there was Jesus, there was the Holy Spirit, somehow different expressions of the one God. Can't we just say that and leave it at that? I'll confess that for decades, the Trinity seemed to me little more than a doctrine I was supposed to believe that I accepted as true, but thought had little to do with my life, had little to do with my relating to God. I experienced God in varied ways. Sure, his fatherly, awe-inspiring presence or his forgiving kindness in Jesus, his moving through the Holy Spirit. But even with all those ways I experienced these aspects of God, the Trinity itself didn't do much to elicit awe or devotion or excitement. I tended to see those three as roles, not as persons, as uh, elements of a job description, but not a fellowship, not a community within themselves. God, yes, Jesus, well, of course he was divine, the spirit, sure, that was how God happened to move and function, but not much more. Then something happened. Part of it had to do with noticing how much the Trinity appears in our worship, how we use Father, Son, and Holy Spirit time after time, like in our acclamation for this morning. Blessed be God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I noticed how often the three names appear together in the Bible. Now the word Trinity, you won't find that in the Bible, but then you don't find the word grandfather in the Bible either. But you can practically hear the word Trinity in the New Testament, where the three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, appear together in the same breath. For one thing, like in Matthew, not in today's lecture and meeting, but readings, but Jesus talked about preaching, making disciples in the name of the what? The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Today's gospel where Jesus told how the Holy Spirit will take what is Jesus and declare it and amplify it. An example again of the three, or two of the three at least, working together. Or there was our, our epistle reading where we hear about the peace of Christ, God's love poured out through the Holy Spirit. There is a trinity. It's a portrait of God that even has foreshadowings in the Old Testament, such as when God says in the creation account, let us, let us make humankind in our own image. As though there was more to God than this solitary, aloof being that never, never had any sense of conversation or communion. And some of the change in me has had to do with seeing how prayers of earlier generations after the Bible, some of our great saints and spiritual life writers, they, they seemed soaked, immersed in an odd, in an odd A-W-E-D awareness, awe-filled awareness of this three-personed God. They talked about the threeness of God, not as some kind of paint by numbers or some kind of intellectual field trip or uh, just something you do for, uh, for a cognitive sport. No, they were trying to grasp the richness of the personality of the God they were coming to know 
who was revealing himself to them. And when they looked at Jesus, they saw God. When they experienced the Holy Spirit, it was God. And then they looked back at times when God was like a father, but then, but then they realized how that was mediated through Jesus, how God's love was made presence, like Paul says in Romans, poured out through the Holy Spirit. And their prayers, these great writers of the church, these great prayers, they were saturated with the sense of the divine community in the Trinity. And that, that made me wonder, it intrigued me. It gave me a sense that there might be more to the God that I know and worship than maybe I had thought before. A richness that had to do with God's very nature as a loving being. I'd begun to think that we've aimed too much of our discussion about the Trinity to the head, not to the heart. Maybe I should say, it's been aimed over our heads instead of aiming at our hearts beating. What we know deep in our souls is a need for communion and community and conversation and love. I'm more convinced now that a rich, growing Christian life means not just becoming aware of the Trinity, but experiencing the Trinity and what it can mean for our own closeness with God. And it's possible, I believe, because it has to do with the experiences we have in our richest moments of communion with other people, with God's wider creation. I mean, I mean those times when, <coughs> pardon me, we sit as children in a mother's lap, uh, the kinds of motions of the heart you feel when you look with great affection at a relative, a spouse, or a friend, or times we sit around a table in wonderful fellowship with a group of people and we know we belong. And there's something bigger than the sum of our parts. Or to say that word Trinity, to picture God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reminds us that God exists. God lives in holy relating. The names alone, Father, Son, even Spirit suggest relationship. It's not, and by the way, this idea that we can easily substitute for God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, instead uh, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. Well, those are fine words, but they're not personal. We're not talking here about a job description. We're not talking about God putting on masks like an actor in a play. See, I begin to realize that the Trinity tries to help us see how amazing and how relational God is. Not aloof, not shut up in the distant heavens, but very much a part of the flux and the give and take of human relating. God is, who is far, far, far above it. And yet our human relating gives us clues to what God himself is like. A God so rich in relationship that even before time, God's nature was to relate. One writer says, if there's only one God, but not three persons within the one God, then we would expect that the ultimate reality behind the universe could be silence, it could be power, it could be peace, it could be domination. But it would not be love, because love, for love to exist, there has to be a sharing, there has to be a communication, there has to be a self-giving. The Trinity tells us God's not a lonely, solitary force. God himself, in God's very being, knows what it means to share in the richness of love and affection, because that's what we see. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The intimacy of Jesus as he prays to the Father, the way the, the, the Father communicated his will and his love to his beloved Son, the way Jesus said that he would send the Spirit, the Counselor, all point to a mutuality, a cooperation, a divine community, a portrait of loving relationship. Well, what's so difficult about that? Now, one more thing. 
Sometimes in our frustrated efforts to understand, we throw up our hands and we say, oh, the Trinity is a mystery. Yes, it is a mystery, but it's as though we say that since our minds cannot fully grasp it, which they can't, we'll simply content ourselves with staying confused and confounded. One Catholic educator talked about how growing up in Catholic schools, she got frustrated. She said, just because the, the Trinity is a mystery doesn't mean we can't try to understand more about who that God is. And there's another way to think about mystery, not as something confounding, something that's forever blocked from our experience or comprehension, a way related to what I'm saying about the Trinity as a portrait of a relational God. Where we speak not only of the mystery of things we cannot understand, we also, we also speak of the mystery of things that move us, move us profoundly. The teacher, Steve Guthrie, uh, he has a book called Creator Spirit, and, and he says this, he said, to say the word mystery is not to leave behind the world of the personal, He's helped me reclaim mystery as a word that, well, it relates in some ways to the relationships in my life. He says it is persons with whom we speak and who speak to us, and it is persons who remain always beyond what we can say about them. It is persons whom we most genuinely speak of knowing, and it is persons who are most truly beyond our knowing and who will always remain to some degree mysterious. Indeed, he says, the mysterious is preeminently the, do the domain of the personal. To say something's a mystery in this way is, is, is not to give up on it, it's to be invited to go deeper in. The Trinity is a mystery, not in the sense that we shrink back in despair of ever knowing God or experiencing him, but in the sense that there is so much personal richness in this God that we will spend a lifetime and an eternity familiarizing our hearts with it, with him. The Trinity says that at the heart of all reality, it's not a mere force, but a community of love, a community not living for itself, but rather who invites you and me to experience that love that life. He wants to include us in that heavenly life and communion. He wants to relate to us. This is an invitation from a personal God who says to us, you can know me. You can know me too. It's simple when you think of it like that. Simple and wonderful. I invite you to turn with me in the prayer book to page 358 for the Nicene Creed, a creed whose very structure reminds us of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with the Trinity as a kind of a backbone running throughout the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made, and for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic 
and apostolic church. We acknowledge when baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people, form four, found in the prayer book, page 388. I will say, Lord, in your mercy and your response is, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially Justin, Archbishop, Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, Tim, our rector. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good, especially Joseph, our president, Glenn, our governor, Dexter, our mayor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he serves as he loves us. We pray for first responders, medical workers, educators, those who serve in law enforcement, those serving in the military, Alex, William, Dexter, Jeremiah, David, Jonathan, Cameron, Byron. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray for our vestry, lay leaders, for relatives, friends, members, for Brenda, Edwina, Kathy, Angela, Dolores, Robert, Tucker, B, Clarence, LW, Donna, Edward, Carolyn, Marshall, Susan, Jane, Luke, Rhonda, Darlene, Frida, Ruben, Kate, Edna, Hilda, Betty, Sue Ann, and Violet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.